Today, a flower is being made radioactive. Why? Because we received a fresh batch of phosphorus 32 in the form of potassium dihydrogen phosphate. And I just wanted to investigate whether certain regions of a plant retain more phosphate than others. Phosphorus is generally present everywhere in living organisms since it's part of the DNA's sugar phosphate backbone. Phosphorus in nature exists exclusively as stable phosphorus 31. The radionuclide used here is carrier-free phosphorus 32. You might think that phosphorus 32 is produced through a simple N-gamma reaction in a reactor by neutron irradiation of natural phosphorus. However, that is not the case because you wouldn't convert all of the phosphorus 31, leaving you with a mixture of phosphorus 31 and phosphorus 32. If you want pure phosphorus 32, as we have here, it is produced through an NP reaction with sulfur. Sulfur 32 is converted into phosphorus 32, and due to the different chemistry of sulfur and phosphorus, pure phosphorus 32 is obtained, which can be used for research. First, a few preliminary tests since there are no detailed procedures available and I'm not a biologist. First, the detector had to be connected. It had a protective plastic cap, but I wanted to check if it actually does something. The great thing about phosphorus 32 is that it lacks gamma lines and has a high beta energy of up to 1710 kilo electron volts. As suspected, the cap doesn't help. So I made a custom shield to selectively measure specific sections of the flower without interference of phosphorus 32 in other parts of the plant. Naturally, the readings will still be strongly affected by Brems Strahlung, but there was nothing else I could practically do in the lab. Fortunately, lead is so soft that I could bend it by hand and that made the whole procedure very easy. It takes two layers of lead to fully shield the beta radiation. The plant was first soaked in 50 milliliters of distilled water and measurements were taken every two centimeters to establish a baseline. Could have I just measured the wall? Yes, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. And yes, the still water is hypotonic, but the plant will die in 3 to 4 days anyway. Next, 200 microliters of the phosphorus 32 solution was added to the 500 milliliters of distilled water. The plant was left there for 15 minutes. Not because it's scientifically valid, but just because I needed time to rearrange things. As you can see, nothing visibly happened. There was no significant activity measured in the flower. The activity detected likely came from active droplets left on the inner wall of the cylinder. I tried again with a new flower and a much higher phosphor 32 concentration. 700 microliters and 10 milliliters of water alongside with two spatula tips of uranine a fluorescent dye. We wanted to see what spreads more easily in the plant, but that didn't work out, still had a nice effect for future experiments. After three hours, not much activity was in the plant. However, after three days of waiting, the flower became very active. The counts were much higher and to have a better count rate, I rotated the container 180 degrees and measured yet again. The flower was then dissected. I first measured without the plastic cylinder and the lowest position registered at 22,307 counts. Each measurement was taken over 30 seconds, followed by a 30 second break, while I moved the detector 2 centimeters away and noted the value. Each leaf was then cut off, its position on the stem was recorded and measured in 2 centimeter sectors again. Now take a look what the contamination monitor reads. 114,000 counts per second. That's something I've never seen before. The dose rate was moderately low at 1 microsieverts an hour. With the measurements done, what does the distribution of phosphorus 32 look like in the plant? The activity was increased at the base of the leaves. But why do I do this? This experiment was inspired by a paper titled The use of phosphorus 32 in studies on uptake of phosphorus by plants. They had the luxury of using a plant in a pot with a 500 square centimeter surface area, something not feasible in our lab. Their plant was a barley and they investigated how much phosphor 32 applied as different phosphates for fertilizers accumulated in the plants. The main findings were that phosphorus concentration in the plant increased over the first 40 to 50 days and then plateaued until harvest. Phosphorus 32 was introduced in three different forms. Calcium hydrogen phosphate, calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxyapatite. The results showed that phosphorus concentrations plays a significant role in plant growth. Further, they demonstrated that increasing the soil phosphate concentration beyond a certain point 
no longer leads to more phosphate in the plant, diminishing returns. Hydroxyapatate was found to be less effective as the amount of radiophosphorus in the plant was significantly lower after 106 days compared to other phosphate forms regardless of concentration. The authors summed up their findings in a similar way. Yes, these are definitely interesting findings and I have much fun making this video. But on a serious note, clearly the method I used in the experiment wasn't highly scientific. I just wanted to see if it would work and whether my use method would offer any value. Now we have rudimentary understanding on how phosphorus 32 is being distributed spatially in the plant. Creating a plant-friendly environment in a nuclear lab just isn't feasible and parts of the phosphor 32 solution was reused. I used the same solution for a video about the properties of beta minus radiation which is already uploaded here on the channel. By the time this video is released all of the phosphorus 32 will have been decayed completely for all practical purposes. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my patrons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.